Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We'd love to have you. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 28. And what an interesting chapter. We had a very righteous king of Judah by the name of Jehoshaphat. And he was doing very well and had sent out uh, the princes of the tribes and Levites and priests to teach people the Word of God. You can't expect people to do the Word of God if they don't know the Word of God. So Jehoshaphat was doing some very good things and destroying uh, the places of uh, idol worship. And, but then uh, at the beginning of chapter 20, uh, 18, we learned that uh, he had an affinity with Ahab. This means that uh, there was a marriage. Jehoram, uh, Jehoshaphat's son, married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. Uh, that was a wicked, wicked family, uh, from Jezebel to Ahab to the daughter. Uh, that marriage would eventually, in the future to the point that we are here in the Bible now, would cause the Jerusalem to run with blood. Now. What had happened was Ahab had lost part of their territory, the ten northern tribes, to Benadad, the king of Syria, Ramoth Gilead to be specific. And he asked Jehoshaphat, uh, come and go up with me to Ramoth Gilead to war with Benadad and Syria. And Ahab said, or excuse me, Jehoshaphat said, well, you know, don't you, do we have a prophet here that we could inquire of? And Je Jezebel and uh, Ahab always had 400 or 450 prophets of this or that around, but they weren't prophets of God. They were false prophets. And Jehoshaphat wasn't convinced. They jumped around and said, go up to Ramoth Gilead, the false prophets did, and you'll be victorious. Trust us. And Jehoshaphat said, don't you, just, don't you even have one true prophet of Yahweh here? And Ahab said, well, yeah, there is one, Micaiah, but I don't like him. He hates me and never prophesies good of me. And Jehoshaphat persisted, and they sent for Micaiah. Uh, Micaiah, the true prophet of God, told him what was going to happen was they were going to go up to Ramoth Gilead, uh, the shepherd would be killed and the sheep would wander around and then go home. Uh, translated, that means Ahab, the shepherd, is going to die uh, while the rest of the Israelites wander around on the hillside of Ramoth Gilead and then eventually go home. Well, uh, Ahab was furious at that prophecy and he sent Micaiah back to where he came from, which we found out in the last part of our lesson yesterday, that was prison, and to feed him water uh, and food of bread of affliction. And the last thing that we heard yesterday in our last lesson was Micaiah, well, Ahab said, take him back to prison until I come back and return in peace. In other words, until I go up to Ramoth Gilead, war against the Syrians and return alive and well. Micaiah said, if you return from the war with Syria and Ramoth Gilead alive and well, I'm not a prophet of God and he has not spoken through me. And with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it back up where we left off. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 28, and it reads, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. Looks to me like Jehoshaphat would have changed his mind with the prophecy of Micaiah. He had to have heard what the prophecy of God was, but he's still going up to Ramoth Gilead. 
with the 400 prophets uh, that uh, Ahab and Jezebel had be right, or would the one prophet of Yahweh be right? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to battle. Ahab is disguising himself as a regular soldier, but he's putting a target on Jehoshaphat's back. And we're going to learn in the next few verses that Benadad, the king of Syria, said don't go after uh, small or great. In other words, don't go after anyone except Ahab, the king of Israel. So what Ahab is saying here is I'm going to dress just like a normal soldier, but you, Jehoshaphat, put on your crown and your robes and oh, why don't we bring your throne along with us and we'll just set it over here to the edge of the battle. I think Ahab maybe too thinks that disguising himself uh, might change the prophecy of Micaiah. Again, it sounds to me like uh, Jehoshaphat would have been on the way south back to Jerusalem at this point in time. Uh, I think a lot of Jehoshaphat and what he did for the nation of Judah, but I don't think much of him playing a fool uh, for Ahab, and that's what Ahab is doing, is playing him a fool. Here, you dress up like the king, knowing that that's all that Benadad wanted to do was to kill the king. You heard the term jumping Jehoshaphat. It looks to me like Jehoshaphat would have been jumping off of this ship and headed home. Verse 30, now the king of Syria, that's Benadad, had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him in his Syrian army, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. I want you to go after Ahab. That's all that I want is Ahab's head. This is God in control. You see, uh, God had judged this death upon Ahab to die in battle because he stole, uh, murdered Naboth for his vineyard. Verse 31, And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, It is the king of Israel, uh, Ahab in other words. Therefore they compassed, this encircled about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. Jehoshaphat, we're going to learn in this lesson, uh, the Lord thought that he had some good in him. Although he messed up big time by uh, forming this affinity uh, with Ahab and going into battle with him. It was Ahab that God <clears throat> wanted punished for what he did to Naboth and his sons. Verse 32. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. Benadad said, I want Ahab. They realized that it wasn't Ahab, it was Jehoshaphat, the king, but not the king of Israel, the king of Judah. And they pulled back. 33. And a certain man, this being one of the Syrian soldiers, drew a bow at a venture. This means in simplicity. He, he really wasn't aiming or trying to hit anything or anyone in particular. And smote the king of Israel, that's Ahab, between the joints of the harness on the breastplate where he was not uh, protected from the arrow. Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thine hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Let's get out of here. Now, do you think that was just a lucky uh, shot by the Syrian soldier? Uh, I think you know not. Verse 34. And the battle increased that day. Howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself. He, he held himself up in his chariot so not to discourage his soldiers up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. 
and about the time of the sun going down, he died. And the prophecy of the one prophet of Yahweh, Micaiah, came to pass, whereas the false prophets, the 400, uh, that did not come to pass. They said, go up to Ramoth Gilead, the 400 false prophets, and you'll be successful. Well, they were wrong. You know, this wasn't the only prophecy that was fulfilled by what happened in, in soon after this event. Uh, the great prophet Elijah uh, prophesied in 1 Kings chapter 22 that just as the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth uh, in Naboth's vineyard, so would the dogs lick up the blood of Ahab. And it's written there in 1 Kings 22, again, prophecy of Elijah that the, the blood of Ahab would also be licked up of the dogs. And soon after uh, Ahab died, uh, they returned his chariot to Samaria, the capital of the 10 northern tribes. And one was assigned to clean up the chariot. And of course he was using water, wash out the blood of Ahab. And it's written there in 1 Kings 22 that the blood of Ahab, then the dogs came along and licked it up in Samaria. Prophecy came to pass. Chapter 19, we're going to see that, there, that Jehoshaphat escaped with his life from the battles of Ramoth Gilead, but there's still chastisement coming his way. He messed up uh, by forming that uh, allegiance with Ahab. And we can look back over the events of chapter 18. And I'd really like for you to hang on to two things. One is watch who you associate with. Because if you associate with ungodly people, you're going to be perceived as being ungodly yourself. And the second thing is uh, trust in God. Uh, don't pay attention to false prophets. We have a lot of false prophets in the world today. Uh, don't be deceived by them. They'll lead you right into Antichrist camp. So be aware of them. Uh, study God's word so that you know when a prophet is a false prophet or a true prophet. Let's go with chapter 19, verse 1. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. That uh, in stark contrast to Ahab's demise. Ahab said, you hold Micaiah in prison and feed him the bread of affliction and water of affliction until I return in peace. Well, that didn't happen. He, he died at Ramoth Gilead. Verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, that's another word for a prophet, this being a true prophet of God as well, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Any question about who uh, uh, Jehu is talking about? There shouldn't be. He's talking about Ahab. Therefore is wrath or anger upon thee from before the Lord. Uh, war with the Moabites and the Ammonites is on the horizon. Uh, the punishment and judgment of God upon uh, Jehoshaphat. Do things God's way and have peace and prosperity. Don't do things God's way and have turmoil and war in your life. Constant conflict. Verse 3. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So in verse 2 we see reproval, in verse 3 we have approval. So, and it's, it's always good to have something good that you've done. Uh, so, and what we're going to see is that this good that Jehoshaphat had is probably going to uh, cause the punishment to be less uh, than what it would have been for his affiliation uh, with Ahab. This word groves, 
uh, check it out in the strong in your strongs in coordinates it's Asheroth and Asheroth was a uh, Phoenician goddess uh, the Assyrians called this goddess Ishtar and this is the, what are the word that's crept into the King James Version Bible in the book of Acts called Easter you see though Easter Ishtar was a Phoenician goddess of fertility and uh, and that's what the Assyrians called her, the Phoenicians called her Ashtaroth. And so uh, Easter is actually a pagan spring festival, an orgy, if you will, in the groves. And we've let that creep into Christian religion as a religious holiday. We've got the Easter bunny, quick like a rabbit, uh, the Easter, the eggs, all symbolic of fertility and reproduction and we've let that become a part of our high feast day of Passover, our high Sabbath. Verse 4, And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. Now this was a second time that he did this back in chapter uh, 17 verse 9 and 10 he sent uh, the princes of the tribes of Judah and the Levites and the priests throughout the land this from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim meaning from one end of it to the other uh, from north to south and uh, he again though is adding to his list of good things that God could find in him and that he's educating the people in the Word of God once again. He's uh, getting serious this time about uh, serving the Lord and serving Him well. Verse 5, And he, Jehoshaphat, set judges uh, in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah. Fenced cities would uh, be larger cities and therefore uh, centers of communication. City by city, and, and Judah, city by city, uh, and, and that's what happened there. He sent them throughout the land teaching the word of God. Verse 6, and that's not all he did. And he said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, not for man's will, but for the Lord, the Lord's will, in other words, who is with you in judgment. You do things God's way, and he will be with you in judgment. Now, at the time of this writing, the judges were most likely Levites and priests who were very familiar with God's law, or should be anyway. So, um, and let me say, start by saying that, you know, we have some good judges today. They, they judge fairly. But I'm afraid all too often we've allowed the system to go away from judges interpreting the Constitution uh, to passing legislature or changing things to where the leg what the legislature should be doing, the judges take on themselves to do. Uh, all too often the judges are judging by precedent rather than by, you know, our ancestors set our judicial system up based on God's Word. What's right and what's wrong? What's legal? What's illegal? And, but we've taken it now to the level where uh, it's a judgment by precedent, not what's right or wrong, but if there's a precedent set, we have to keep doing it because it's precedent. So. Uh, I, I look forward to the day when the judge, that's with a capital J, uh, takes back over the reins of judgment. I want him to judge me, not some man. Verse 7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Now this word fear, oftentimes in the Old Testament, uh, I think the Hebrew word is yare. This is not what this word is, but usually in the Old Testament, it's Yahweh, fear is, which can be either fear or revere. This word cannot be revere. It means alarm or dread, uh, and it's a serious warning. 
fear the Lord be upon you. Now, this is directed to the judges. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. The Lord doesn't take gifts. You can't buy your own redemption, your own salvation. It's not for sale. I don't care how much money you've got. God will not sell your salvation to you. And what he's saying here is God won't take bribes and you judges don't take bribes either. Respect of persons means that uh, God does not show partiality uh, or favoritism to one person over another. And justice should be blind. Uh, it, it, there's either a right or a wrong, not because you know somebody or you like somebody. Uh, that should not enter into a judge's mind, what's right and what's wrong. Verse 8, Moreover, in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief, this would be the heads or princes, of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they return to Jerusalem. In other words, they would hear the cases out in the countryside and if there was a controversy, a decision couldn't be made. In other words, they would pass it on up the line to Jerusalem to, you could think of it as a supreme court uh, on that level, a tribunal court. Cases that could not be decided by the judges in the outlying areas would be passed along to Jerusalem. Verse 9, And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart, with a complete or a whole uh, heart. Term. Your heart can also be translated as mind. Verse 10, and what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities between blood and blood. Now this is talking about criminal cases, uh, premeditated murder, uh, manslaughter, etc. Between law and con commandment, between interpretation and application, statutes and judgments, you shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord, and so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren, upon the nation. This do, and ye shall not trespass. And, you know, when we teach the book of Leviticus, uh, for example, here at Shepherd's Chapel, uh, oftentimes we get letters from people, you're Christians, why, why are you teaching the Old Testament? Jesus changed all of that. Now, Jesus didn't change one jot or tittle of the law. And when we teach people the law, we're warning them. And I like this, that when someone trespasses against uh, the law, it can also affect the nation. Um, but that's not to say, in other words, a nation, if you have good leaders, uh, they're usually going to not break the law, and the nation does well. But if you have leaders who are breaking the law, the nation goes downhill and the whole nation is going to pay uh, from the anger and the wrath of God. Now that's not to say that an individual, even if the nation is going poorly, an individual who loves and serves the Lord uh, can come out uh, with blessings uh, as opposed to those who are suffering suffering the consequences of uh, the, the sin and breaking of the law. Teach or enlighten them as to God's word. Verse 11, And behold, Amariah, the chief priest, that's the high priest, is over you in all matters of the Lord. And Zabadiah, Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler or prince of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters. Also the Levites shall be officers before you. Deal courageously, and the Lord shall be with the good, with those who discharge the duties of their office. Well, the Lord will be with them. So Amariah, the high priest, 
would be over matters, spiritual law, if you will, or matters, and uh, Zebediah would be over the civil matters, if you will. So uh, a good setup and uh, I think uh, uh, suitable to a pious, righteous king such as uh, Jehoshaphat. Now, we come to chapter 20. Uh, I mentioned in the previous chapter the judgment of the Lord was communicated to Jehoshaphat through the prophet Jehu. And uh, things are not going to go well for Jehoshaphat. Let's see how Jehoshaphat handles it this time, though. We had cases where when a nation attacked, uh, the king would go and try and hire other nations to help them, to protect them. Uh, let's see how Joseph, Jehoshaphat handles the adversity. Chapter 20, verse 1. It came to pass after this, after the death of Ahab, also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. We're going to learn that these other besides in verse 10 were the people of Mount Seir. In other words, they were Edomites. Now, notice Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites are all Adamic peoples. Uh, Moab and Ammon were descendants, the sons of Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. Uh, and of course, the Edomites were descendants of Esau, one of Jacob's, uh, excuse me, one of Isaac's sons. So uh, we have uh, Adamic peoples here involved in this. This would be all these events that we're reading now would be in the last two or three years of Jehoshaphat's reign. Verse 2, Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria, from beyond the Dead Sea. And behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, Tamar, which is in Engedi. This would be midway along the west coast uh, or border. In other words, they're about 15 hours of, of travel time via the method that they had at this time. So we're talking they're two days away. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. A fast to, is to humble yourself or bow uh, before the Lord. The lesson of Chronicles, seek the Lord and he will be found of you. If you forsake the Lord, he will forsake you. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and he will be found of you. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Now, there wasn't a new court that was built. Uh, what this is is a, the outer court was restored because over the years it had become damaged and so it was restored. Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation. I'm sure he was on the platform that Solomon had built so that he could be seen and heard by the congregation at the dedication of the house of God. Verse 6, And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. These words almost word for word, the words of David in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 12. Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land, the promised land, the land of Canaan, before thy people Israel? and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever. Abraham is called the friend of God, not only here, but also in Isaiah 
uh, chapter 41, verse 8, and even in the New Testament in James chapter 2, verse 23, verse 8. And they dwelt therein, Israel dwelt in the promised land, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying. Now, for thy name, in other words, your, your glory appeared in the temple, and therefore we built the sanctuary in or for thy name. If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction or our distress, then wilt thou hear and help. This was Solomon's prayer at the dedication of Solomon's temple, that at any time that anyone of Israel was distressed, uh, whether that be in a foreign land because they had been taken into captivity, in that case, if they would pray toward Jerusalem, that God would hear and deliver them from their distress, their oppression. Verse 10, And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, that's the Edomites, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Now, what this is about is in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, we learned that when Israel was traveling from the land of Egypt to Canaan, to the promised land, that they asked the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites at one point or another to cross their geographic land and said, we won't go to the left or right from the king's highway. We won't eat your crops. We won't drink your water. And if we do, we'll pay you for it. And they said, no, you can't. But God told them in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 4, God told them you won't war against the Moabites and Ammonites and Edomites because they are Adamic peoples. Verse 11, Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. In other words, Ammon and Moab were of Lot's sons, Adamic people, uh, Edomites of Esau. As a result of this, Numbers chapter 20 verse 21 records that uh, Israel was, went around Edom and Moab and Ammon and the going was hard, and that's when God sent the uh, serpents, the fiery serpents among the people, and they were complaining, why did you bring us out here, God, to die in this wilderness? And uh, when the serpents bit the people, they died, and they, as usual, went crying to Moses, you got, we send, help us, pray for us. And uh, God instructed Moses to make that brass serpent and instructed him to put it on a pole and raise it up and that the people looked on it and believed, in other words, they would not die from the bites of these fiery serpents. Well, we'll come back in our next lecture and see uh, what, how this all turns out with the Ammonites but, and the Moabites and the Edomites, but Jehoshaphat's doing the right thing here. He's not running to the king of Syria, Benadad, to help him. He's not running to uh, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, to help him. Uh, he's turning his trust and faith in the Lord. That's the best ally you can have. I've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the Scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek, in which God's Word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. 
The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout uh, the U.S., Puerto Rico, and our good friends to the north in Canada. Uh, if you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions that aren't of a biblical nature. Please don't ask questions that uh, address a specific individual denomination, organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone, friend. You need to talk to your Father. You need to go to Him in prayer and thank Him for the many blessings that He bestows upon you. Uh, to communicate with him. You can talk to him like he's your closest relative. He is your closest relative. Talk to him like he's your father. He is your father. And you know what? He loves you. He may or may not love what you're doing, but he does love you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, financial difficulties, marital problems, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's go to some questions. First up today, we have Urban in South Carolina. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40, it talks about celestial and terrestrial bodies. Which one is the spiritual body and which one is the flesh body? The terrestrial uh, is the flesh body. The celestial is the spiritual body. And that's an excellent teaching uh, by Paul there in Corinthians 15 about that we have two different bodies. Uh, Sean in Missouri, what is involved with a spiritual death? Does it mean they lose their mind and memories and then a demon takes them into the world? No, that doesn't quite mean that. Spiritual death to me is the second death. Uh, Paul's teaching in 1 uh, Corinthians 15 that, that we have two bodies. And the death of the flesh body is really not all that big a deal. It's not the death of your soul. Now, the death of your soul, which is the second death, uh, takes place after the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. That's what a spiritual death is. Now, there are people in Revelation chapter 20 brought to mind that you have people who are spiritually dead. But now what that is is that they've gone so far away from God and, and lost their way and lost their focus. Uh, but everyone other than God's elect through the millennium, the thousand year period, will be dead as it states there in, first, uh, in Revelation chapter 20. And it doesn't mean the second death, it means they will be spiritually dead though. Uh, then you have the white throne judgment, but also before the white throne judgment, it's going to be a great period of teaching. And I don't know who this is or where they're from. The Canaan oh, was sent away. Was Ham also sent away? And I'm sure uh, this person is asking about what happened in Genesis chapter 9 when Ham uncovered his father's nakedness and Canaan was the result. Uh, Canaan was sent away and cursed, not by God, but by Noah. Why? Because Canaan was the result of a uh, incestuous relationship between his son and his wife. That's what to uncover your father's nakedness means, is to lie with his wife. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20 will document that. Maryland and Arizona, Ezekiel 13, uh, where, where you say it talks about not flying away. I can't find it and I'm, 
and I'm trying to help someone else. We'll look in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 20, and you'll find there the Lord speaking. He says, I will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. And in previous verses, uh, it talks about that they sew uh, pillows or coverings to cover the arms, uh, the outstretched arms of God to try and help his children and teach them to fly to save their souls. And God says, I'm against it. Loriano in Colorado, where does it say we'll all be female in the eternity? I find it odd when all angels are male. And uh, you heard me speaking, I'm sure uh, I was speaking spiritually about that period of time and saying that uh, we are all going to be the bride of Christ. Bride is feminine, and that's what I meant by we will all be feminine because we'll be the bride of Christ. But you're right, there won't be male and female. We only have male and female bodies in our flesh bodies, not our spiritual. Jordan in Missouri, how do I equip myself with the right words when someone in my family is suffering from addiction? Well. I might suggest you or your family or both uh, set up an intervention, now, which is a meeting in which you confront the person about their addiction. And you need to be very careful about how you do that, though, because you can, it can go bad on you in a hurry if you don't prepare. Um, there are people who can, professional people who uh, do this sort of thing day in and day out, uh, I would first seek their input, their help in confronting this relative with their addiction. Again, it can be a very positive thing. It can also be a very pot negative thing if you don't do it right. So seek out professionals and uh, hopefully you can get your loved one back and, and, and have them back to being straight again. Uh, we'll have that in prayer here at the chapel. Donna in Georgia, is it a sin to be cremated? Absolutely not. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, we learn that when we die, the flesh returns to the earth from which it came, and the spirit returns to our Heavenly Father from whence it came. So uh, how the flesh uh, gets back to the Earth doesn't matter, but beware of this. You're never going to need your flesh body again. Uh, this teaching that when Jesus returns, all the graves are going to open and all these flesh bodies are going to come up out of the grade, uh, grave is not true. That's false teaching. Who would want to go through the eternity in a flesh body, a body that gets old, a body that gets sick? We have something better waiting on us, and that's our spiritual bodies when we step out of this flesh. Now, you do have funeral directors that would love to sell you or your relatives a $15,000 uh, casket uh, in funeral service. Why? Because they make money when you do that. But uh, cremation is an inexpensive alternative to expensive funerals. Funerals are not for the person who is deceased. They're for the surviving family and friends to uh, celebrate the life of that person who's gone on uh, and to remember them. Vera in Illinois, just as easily done with the urn with ashes in it as a casket uh, with the remains in it. Vera in Illinois, I'm a woman of color. Uh, are all Caucasians considered white people, are they the tribes of Israel? Uh, okay, well, yes, uh, you, you say you're a woman of color. Now, that means you are one of the ethnic peoples who were created by the Lord in Genesis chapter 1. Now, the descendants of Abraham, uh, more through Isaac and Jacob, uh, are Caucasian peoples. They're Adamic peoples. They became known as Caucasians after the ten northern tribes 
went into captivity to the Assyrians. And when that captivity ended, those peoples went north over the Caucasus Mountains. And that's how they became known as Caucasian peoples. And they settled in Europe and then migrated, many of them, on to the United States and Canada. Uh, most of them having a clue who they are today. Richard in Arizona, I can't find Yahweh in my Bible or the Strong's Concordance. Where can I find it in Scripture? Well, there's four places in the book of Esther, maybe five. Uh, there's one place in the book of Psalms, uh, which but they're in acrostics. And uh, if you, uh, the best thing for you to do, Richard, probably would be to order a paper uh, written by Pastor Arnold Murray entitled The Sacred Name. It's free uh, if you're sending a donation or uh, ordering CDs or tapes. Uh, you can request that and we'll include it for at no charge. Uh, if you're not ordering or placing a donation, feel free to send a stamped self-addressed business size envelope and we'll be happy to send a copy of The Sacred Name. Venus in Alabama, Mark 3.29 says, in quotes, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Could you elaborate on that verse and tell me what that means, please, and thank you. Be happy to. Uh, you also find in Luke uh, chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. Now, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is for one of God's election to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up before the synagogues of Satan, Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. Now, uh, that is unforgivable. It's an un impossible that anyone has committed that sin at this point in time. Why? Because none of God's elect have been delivered up before the synagogues of Satan. Greg from Florida, I'm a longtime student. Thank you for your service. Uh, I was in the Army in the Vietnam era. Thank you for serving our country. Uh, my question, what is the difference between a prophet and a disciple? Thank you for your teaching chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Have a blessed day in Jesus' name, I pray. And I hope you have a blessed day as well, Greg. Okay, good question. A prophet, uh, for the most part, appeared in the Old Testament. Uh, you've got the prophets uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the minor prophets. Uh, we did have prophets in the New Testament. Uh, John the Baptist was a prophet. Of course, Jesus Christ would be considered a prophet. A prophet is, uh, is also called a seer in the Old Testament. We had an example of that today in our lesson. A prophet speaks the word of God. Now, a disciple, uh, on the other hand, and you'll find that word only used in the New Testament, and it's the Greek word mathetes, and it means a learner or a pupil. Uh, an apostle is the next step up from a disciple. When Jesus sent the disciples forth, that's what apostle means, is one sent forth. They then became not disciples, but apostles. Robert from Missouri, and thank you for your kind comments. Um, question, we would like to know if the whole earth was flooded when Noah made the ark and then the flood. Maybe we will hear this on the air. I hope you do. I hope you're watching and hear it. But, uh, but it's possible that the entire earth was flooded, but it's also possible that not the entire earth was flooded. Um, how do we have the races on earth today? Well, Noah was instructed to take two of every flesh. That would certainly include uh, people of, uh, of color, the Gentiles the nations and, and ethnos, if you will. But uh, anyway, one day we'll know whether it was the entire earth or just the area. What was the purpose 
of Noah's flood. It was to wipe out the, the descendants, the, the, the children, the geber of the fallen angels because that was Satan's plan to pollute the seed line through which Messiah would come. Satan knew that if Messiah came, he was doomed. But if there was no Messiah, Satan wins. Lee in Mississippi, what will we wear in heaven? Where is that in scripture? Revelation chapter 19, verse eight. Uh, the fine linen in your robe is made up of your righteous acts. Some folks are gonna have uh, not long, nice robe. Some folks are going to be looking for a tree to stand behind. Gina in Massachusetts, please explain how Cain is the child of the devil. Don't know how a snake can get someone pregnant. Snakes don't talk either. And the serpent in the Garden of Eden spoke. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. When you think of the serpent, don't think of a snake. Uh, you're going to be uh, on the wrong track. The Satan was the serpent in the Garden of Eden. That's the reason he could speak. Uh, he seduced Mother Eve. And then the Greek, it's uh, that uh, Paul wrote, I don't want you to be uh, seduced or can, uh, deceived as Eve was deceived by the Satan. That word means expatio in the Greek. That means holy, seduced. So, uh, and you know, if you think uh, a, an angel couldn't impregnate a woman, you're not familiar with Genesis chapter 6 because it happened and it happened more than once. Anonymous in West Virginia, was Jesus Michael the archangel that threw out Satan and his army out of heaven? No, uh, uh, on two counts. Uh, one, it's almost, uh, it's nigh unto blasphemy to call Jesus an angel. He's not an angel. Uh, uh, also, that the, at Michael throwing out Satan and his army, that hasn't happened yet. That's, that's a future event. So. Uh, that happens when uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and the following verses come to pass. Uh, Michael and his angels war against Satan and his angels. Michael prevails and throws uh, Satan out onto earth and it's woe unto you on earth. Dalton in Texas, please explain Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 12. Well, let's back up to verse 11. Uh, if someone lies in wait and murders someone, then in verse 12, the elders of his city shall turn the murderer over to the avenger of blood. That would be a kinsman redeemer, the closest uh, relative that he may die. In other words, we're talking about uh, capital punishment. And that's what God teaches is if someone lies in wait and then they, then what this going to the elders is they, if they flee to one of the uh, cities of refuge, which there were six in Israel, three on the uh, east side of Jordan and three on the west side of Jordan, that the elders and the priest were to make a determination whether the person was guilty or innocent. If the person were innocent, they could stay in the city of refuge and live there and not have to worry about retribution from the next of kin to the deceased. However, if they were guilty, then they were to send back, uh, to send the murderer back to his city and turn him over to the kinsman redeemer. Capital punishment. God said, do things this way and people will see and these things will cease to happen among you. <clears throat> we have a lot of it happening among us today. Rodney in Mississippi, how did the Kenites survive the flood? Well, first, let's document that we know they did. Uh, we can do that in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. That was centuries after the flood, and we had Kenites there. Again, Noah was instructed to take two of every flesh. So if the entire world were flooded during the time of Noah's flood, there were two Kenites on board the ark. If the whole earth, uh, partial earth wasn't flooded, the Kenites could have been residing there uh, during that time. 
Larry in Ohio, who are the Kenites on earth today? Well, Kenites, it's the, the meaning is in the, the, the definition of the, the translation, if you would, of the word. Take your Strong's Concordance and look up the word Kenite. You'll find that it's Hebrew word 7017, which means patron from Hebrew word 7014. 7014 is Cain. Patron, if you go back to the first of your Hebrew dictionary, you'll find that that's an abbreviation for patronymic, which means uh, descendants from the father's side. So the word 7017 means children of Cain is what it means. AJ from Michigan. I watch the program in the mornings. Um, Dish Network to question. Uh, is there a CD, DVD on the tears? No, uh, perhaps I'll do a message on that. Thanks for the suggestion uh, in the future concerning tears. I'm, I'm certain that Pastor Arnold Murray discussed the tares on, on the Kenites uh, message, and that is CD 30436, and you could order that. I'm sure that goes into the tares. And I'm getting the out of time signal. I do want you all to know that I love you a great deal because you make a little time each day, whether it's in the morning, midday, or in the evening, to pull out the letter that God wrote to you and to study it, to, to seek God. And when you seek Him and the lesson from our Chronicles, you will find Him. And you know, it makes Father's Day when He sees you studying the Word, trying to be pleasing to Him. Blessings always follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, beloved, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.